Are the rich doing enough to combat climate change? I'll ask award-winning environmental activist Nemo Bassi. But first, we debate whether the surveillance industry is out of control and how it can be kept in check. Authoritarian regimes and even democracies that want to spy on citizens and clamp down on activist movements can now tap into a murky, largely unregulated global surveillance market. Even criminal organizations are suspected of having gotten their hands on cyber weapons. The surveillance industry has grown basically unchecked. The U.N. has even called for a moratorium on the global sale and transfer of private surveillance technology until new regulations are put in place to protect civil liberties. And it has good reason to worry. The number of cameras used for surveillance globally is expected to reach more than one billion next year. Joining me to discuss this, Iran Deeper, director of the Citizen Lab, an academic group based in Canada that documents state surveillance, and Luis Fernando Garcia, the director of RED, that work in defense of digital rights, a human rights organization in Mexico. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Ron, I want to start with you. So in a report published this month, your lab found that a surveillance firm affiliated with the Israeli cyber arms manufacturer NSO Group likely sold spying technology to at least 25 countries. Yes, that includes authoritarian governments like the United Arab Emirates, but also democratic ones like Belgium. So what does that say about the reach of massive surveillance? Well, I think we've been going through a, a really profound shift in how we communicate over the last couple of decades, at the heart of which is this um, proliferation of sensors and the accum accumulation of data uh, in the hands of a number of private companies. And so you have effectively our, our personal lives turned inside out, and that leaves digital trails and breadcrumbs everywhere. And of course, governments are going to seek to exploit that, to take advantage of it for whatever reason, whether it's law enforcement investigations, national security investigations, or in the case of uh, corrupt actors or autocratic actors to go after political opposition. And uh, in, the, in the same period of time, especially within the last uh, five years, we've seen proliferation of this industry that services their needs. So these are a wide range of companies, um, most of which are based in the West, but that's changing as well. Uh, the technologies are sold to governments without really anyone checking to make sure there's proper due diligence in place to prevent harms. And not surprisingly, we're seeing widespread abuses as a result. So governments are repeatedly uh, using these technologies to go after journalists, to go after human rights defenders, to go after lawyers, um, sometimes even with lethal consequences, as we uh, saw in the case most prominently of the murdered Washington Post uh, uh, columnist Jamal Khashoggi, uh, we found at Citizen Lab that Khashoggi's inner circle of confidence uh, had their phones hacked by Saudi operatives using very sophisticated Israeli surveillance technology. Um, Luis, I want to bring you into this now. In 2017, you worked with, with Citizen Lab to reveal something really startling about the Mexican government. Ron was just talking about things that governments do, right? Um, you revealed that the Mexican government had infected the phones of members of civil society with spyware supplied to them by the Israeli tech company NSO Group, which we mentioned. And according to an investigation by a group of global journalists called the Cartel Project, police forces in Mexico have even sold similar tools to drug cartels they were supposed to be tracking down. So I'm curious, what concerns you the most, the obvious corruption and bad governance, or the fact that companies like NSO Group are able to do business with countries that have a dismal track record on human rights? Exactly. I think uh, sometimes this, the narrative that comes from technology companies that sell this type of surveillance software is that is a very black and white world with good guys, good guys and bad guys. But the reality in places like Mexico is that, for example, uh, the, the line between organized crime and the government itself, it's blurry or non-existent most of the time. So you end up with situations in which uh, malware that is bought using as, a, uh, as an excuse the security situation of a country is in a paradox paradoxically 
used against society. For example, one of the cases is about a human rights group that represents the families of uh, more than 43 students disappeared in Mexico in 2014. And the malware, in, instead of being used to find those responsible for the disappearance of these uh, 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 young students, was used to target the lawyers representing the families from these students. You see also that uh, these tools that are marketed as being sold to combat crime are actually used by criminals either directly or through the corruption and the uh, collusion that exists between many authorities and uh, uh, organized crime members. So let me ask you about that. Given that the, the chance, the potential for abuse that you just talked about as surveillance capabilities, why haven't these technologies come under tight international legal control the same way there are protocols and conventions restricting the use of conventional weapons? Well, I guess because it's it, the same reason because the drug war is not ending is because it's a big business for a lot of people. It's a big business for governments that uh, get to uh, give these contracts, these really huge contracts, very uh, with, with a lot of uh, expression. They can choose who they uh, purchase these tools from because the companies also be become very, very, um, uh, well, uh, rich selling these type of tools. Uh, all these contracts are under a lot of secrecy. There is no transparency on them. And uh, there's a lot of impunity also. Even though we have uncovered, thanks to the work that Citizen Lab has made, yes. more than 25 cases in Mexico, there's total impunity. No one's in jail. Uh, no one is even being tried for surveilling uh, journalists and human rights defenders so, in Mexico. So let me bring Ron into this. Um, Ron, how can we expect there to be any accountability um, on surveillance abuses when even the European Union has supplied drones and wiretapping equipment to Niger, for example, then that's a country whose government ha has cracked down on activists. So there are um, worldwide organizations that seem to be complicit in this. Yeah, Louise is absolutely right here. Uh, financial incentives are huge. This is a big and growing marketplace. It's an industry that makes a lot of people money. I would just add to it that um, traditionally, the type of activities we're talking about here happen to be the most secretive of governments. So, so most governments, especially the well-resourced ones, have within their security apparatus signals intelligence agencies, some of whom go back decades, uh, most of whom operated entirely in the shadows without any accountability. Um, so it's very hard to clean this up for both of those reasons. You have state secrecy, you have a very lucrative industry. It's going to take a lot of work uh, to turn this around and start mitigating uh, what are really um, ho horrific harms uh, Ron, that are proliferating. I, yes. I, I do want to ask you about China. Some of the most egregious uses of surveillance technologies happen in China. Um, the party state employs facial recognition systems to subjugate millions of, of Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region. And China has also exported its monitoring systems to at least 18 countries, including Ecuador and Germany. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for freedom and privacy standards globally? Well, we do really have to uh, worry about China um, because, um, you know, it's, it's quite daunting to think about um, the progression China has gone through over the last 10 years, especially um, where they've proven that, um, you know, having uh, information controls and a, and, and a largely one-party state authoritarian system can coexist, can actually be very profitable when it's combined with this type of surveillance. Um, so it, it suits both the government and it suits uh, the private sector. And so a lot of Chinese companies are innovating around facial recognition, uh, artificial intelligence empowered surveillance. And you're right, they're beginning to export this, which is why there's an urgency to what we're talking about here. If um, Western countries, let's, let's just start with, don't get their own houses in order, don't uh, bring about some degree of accountability over their security agencies and over the companies that are exporting these type of technologies, we won't be able to address the looming threat of Chinese technology, which is already creeping into the marketplace, as you mentioned.
Okay, so let's talk more about using safeguards on on these tools that actually could be beneficial if you have the safeguards. There were some countries that were mm -hmm. really praised for the way they handled COVID-19 pandemic. They curbed the spread of the virus in part um, because of really invasive surveillance tactics. Specifically in Taiwan, the government tracked quarantine residents' GPS locations using their phone numbers, and then we'd get a notification if somebody left an area um, that they were supposed to stay in. So is it that proof some way, Luis, that surveillance can benefit societies? Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. I think there is still a lot of uncertainty and not really a lot of empirical evidence of why certain countries have been more successful than others in combating the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And we have, uh, the same way as you mentioned, Taiwan, we have a lot of examples with very invasive tools that have not been producing those type of results. So I would temper the uh, conclusions on whether massive surveillance is really important. And by the way, that's a really, uh, it's a pandemic, it's a, a, a supposedly emergency uh, situation that is not going to last forever. So uh, it's important to not uh, draw the conclusion that total surveillance is, is good for society. Definitely, you're, you're saying, we don't believe You're saying so. it's getting too much credit in situations like this, you think? Definitely, it's part of the marketing strategy of, of tech companies that want to sell these type of tools. NSO Group rebranded its, its Pegasus tool to try to sell it to governments to combat COVID-19. It's really more of a marketing gimmick that actual, uh, uh, something that are actually based on, 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 on evidence. Safeguards are important, but there are also things that with, even with, with safeguards shouldn't be allowed in a democratic society, or at least we should have a discussion on whether we want to allow in a democratic society to exist. Uh, I, I believe, for example, uh, spyware is, is, is something that uh, it's very difficult to, to, to control even more now because, for example, in the case of Mexico, we were able to document those cases because the per person infected had to click on a link sent on an SMS message. But now we know that uh, NSO Group and other vendors are have the capability of infecting phones without even leaving any trace, without uh, leaving any evidence of that surveillance happening. So that makes it even more difficult to control. So we really need to put, to, to have a really meaningful discussion on where to put red lines, on which technologies we shouldn't allow to be used, uh, and which ones we can uh, allow, but with really strong and robust safeguards that really uh, give meaningful accountability and allow society to exert control over the use of these technologies. So, Ron, do you think there are instances where we're using surveillance technology as justified? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, we live in a very dangerous world. We live in a risk society. We need governments to uh, protect us. Uh, and to enforce the law, if, if for nothing else, than to protect and preserve human rights. And you want governments to be well-equipped to have the technologies they need to be able to do their jobs. Um, the confusion arises when people think there's some kind of trade-off between surveillance and privacy. Uh, what we need are robust restraint mechanisms, safeguards, exactly what you're talking about. There's no incompatibility here. Uh, governments and private companies, for that matter, need to be subjected to independent oversight by appropriate agencies that are established with significant capabilities themselves and authorities to be able to examine, cross-check independently, to make sure that a technology that is extremely invasive, as Louise describes, the latest versions of these type of spyware require no interaction on the part of a target. You can simply ring up a phone and take it over, track that person, turn on their camera. This is like atomic level surveillance capabilities in the hands of governments that are going to abuse them. Obviously, we need to buckle down on restraint mechanisms, which currently do not exist. That will be the final word. Ron Debert, Luis Fernando Garcia, thank you both for joining me in the arena. Thank, thank you very you. much. While the coronavirus crisis grabbed headlines worldwide this year, scientists and activists have been ringing the alarm on another crisis threatening our way of life, climate change. Earlier, I spoke to a pioneer in linking human rights to the environment. Winner of the Right Livelihood Award, widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, Nemo Bassi has founded multiple environmental groups in his native Nigeria. 
a decade ago. He said the richest 1% of the world had decided it was okay to sacrifice the 99%. I started by asking him if anything has changed since then. I would say that things have changed for the worse because at that time there was still an element of seriousness about real climate action. Uh, but um, since then, we're seeing gradually less and less readiness for nations to take real action, but rather negotiations have been more of governments looking for ways to avoid action. And this, to some of us, is what the Paris Agreement was all about. A voluntary agreement where nobody will be held to any binding targets. Uh, and so nations, and they call it a very beautiful name, nationally determined contribution. So nations determine what is suitable for them to do, what is convenient for them to do. And this is nothing, nothing to respond to the serious harms that vulnerable territories, communities, and individuals are being exposed to. So things are actually getting worse. Let's talk about divvying up responsibility. Leaders in the global south will say, we are just trying to grow. We are trying to keep our heads above water. It's not expect, it's not fair rather, to expect them to, to cut back so much on greenhouse gas emissions when there are other fully industrialized countries that should be taking the lead on this. What do you think about that? Uh, it is right for vulnerable poor countries in Africa, in the Pacific, uh, small island states that never really contributed anything significantly to global warming. It's not, it's not right to demand from them to cut emissions that they never created in the first place. Uh, this is why in the current dynamics, you find that uh, there are countries who are proposing to do far more than they need to do. Uh, they are showing more ambition. The countries that never contributed to the climate problem are uh, showing much more ambition to the, than the rich countries, the industrialized countries, who are not uh, serious about short-term measures, but are rather pushing everything to the long-term range so that they can avoid doing anything uh, immediately. But what is needed now is immediate action. Is abandoning fossil fuels a, a, a realistic target? It is realistic. The problem is the kind of narratives we've built over the years. Human beings, our, our history, our life, our economics, our politics, they're all driven by stories that we tell ourselves. Over so many years, people have always said we can't do without fossil fuels. Some even say that uh, fossil fuel will be the major energy source into the foreseeable future. But now science is saying that we just have a few more years to put more carbon into the atmosphere that we have to ship from it. And so if we want humans and other living beings on the planet to survive, we have no option but to ship from fossil fuels. It's not a question of whether we like it or not. It's something that just has to be done. So something that happens in the U.S. is uh, what's seen as a market-based solution, a very um, capitalistic term, and we'll get to that in a minute. But specifically things like cap and trade, um, I don't think you're a fan of that. Why not? Why do you think that that is not the way to go? You know, nature doesn't work by arithmetics. Nature doesn't work on human economic measures. Nature, uh, nature is not the author of capitalism. Uh, cap and trade, carbon offsetting, and all such market uh, mechanisms or market environmentalism uh, began to take a central space from the late 1990s at the Kyoto, when the Kyoto Protocol was being negotiated. I believe, if I remember correctly, most countries wouldn't even imagine uh, calling using uh, market forces or market mechanisms uh, to tackle global warming at that time. But there was a lot of pressure, of course, that that was the way to go. And today we are hearing things like net zero or decarbonization. Decarbonization sounds very beautiful, doesn't it? But net zero simply means uh, it's another way of taking cap and trade uh, some steps forward. It means you can keep on polluting in Europe and then you probably save a few trees in Africa and therefore, I can keep on polluting the atmosphere because the trees somewhere in Africa are countering what I'm doing in Europe. That, that is pure fiction. This is climate fiction. It doesn't address the real issue, which is to stop the pollution. 
and people find a way of making money from crisis, making money from other people's misery. So you cap and trade. You can't pollute enough, so you okay. sell the space you have to others who can pollute more. You said that the, what really needs to happen is the pollution needs to stop. And um, as a result of this horrible pandemic we've been living in, um, in a lot of ways, some pollution has stopped when, when cities stopped, when industries stopped, right? I think you've heard this, um, that people say it's a, it's a return to nature. There, we've seen blue water, blue skies in places that we have not seen before. How does it make you feel that it took something like a deadly pandemic for us to see what can actually happen. Uh, yes, uh, that, what, what really what the pandemic has done has been very dramatic in that sense because it showed that humans can change. We are not. Uh, it's not impossible for us to change. Uh, and so the pandemic forced us to stay in certain places, restricted our movements, restricted our productive our production activities and pollution. And so we could see nature breathe a little bit. Uh, but that was just for a moment. Um, we, we didn't have enough time to learn the lesson that ought to be learned. Uh, and uh, the pandemic would not, could not solve the problems of global warming, uh, couldn't give us clean water for, for any length of time. I'm speaking to you from the Niger Delta. Uh, there were oil spills ongoing during the lockdown. Uh, because the oil corporations were operated, uh, they were considered to be essential services. Can you imagine that? Uh, so they kept on drilling and polluting, even while people were locked up in their homes. Uh, and so we did not, we've missed the opportunity of learning from the pandemic. And I think rather than wait for the pandemic or now or in future to solve the problem, we have to tackle this problem. We have to change the situation by ourselves. We have to mobilize. We have to work in solidarity. We have to join forces to make, ensure that we see the change that is needed. So let's pivot to Boko Haram for a moment. And I know that some people may not understand how that fits this conversation, but it does. Because whenever you talk about Boko Haram, we often talk about it in, in a religious or security context. But there is very much an environmental lens also to look at when you talk about Boko Haram and what is happening in Nigeria. Um, why don't we see more of the connection between the two? Well, you know, um, generally, environment is not uh, does, does not take the top range in news and in political conversations. Uh, it's, it's much more easier to talk about religion as a, as a driver of violence. And of course, those who are causing the violence are also hoist religion as a reason for, for the violence. Uh, but uh, it's been seen also that uh, there are a lot of instability in the northeastern part of Nigeria uh, is caused by environmental factors. Uh, lake Chad, which is uh, the biggest freshwater, inland freshwater lake in West Africa, uh, shared by Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, and Niger, uh, has shrunk by more than 90 percent the size it was in the 1960s. Uh, this has meant displacement of fishers, displacement of pastoralists, displacement of, well, of farmers. And of course, when they move, they move there, they create more conflicts where they move to. Uh, these people who are displaced are forced either easily, when they lose their means of livelihood, they can easily be recruited into this kind of militia groups, or they could just migrate somewhere else and create more conflict. So we have serious problems with environmental refugees in Nigeria, in West Africa, uh, as well as uh, conflict created by global warming. I want to end on a, uh, a personal note. Um, what you do is dangerous. All right. You mentioned that when you started your activism, um, the country was under military rule. You have been incarcerated, detained, harassed. Some activists have, have paid with their lives. And specifically, one study found that killings of environmental defenders have doubled over the last 15 years to reach levels usually associated with war zones. Do you ever personally fear for your safety, for your life? Um, well, you know, when you take on the kind of work that we do, it is driven more by commitment and passion than by anything else. Uh, when each time I go to Ogoni, Ogoni land, for example, and sit down on the shores of the polluted rivers, I just tell myself the job is not done. Uh, when things like that, we, we, uh, when we are conscious of those kind of situations, uh, we just don't have any option 
but to keep on pressing for justice. That'll be the final word, Mr. Nemo Bassi. Thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. That is our show. Up front, we'll be back next year.